talk a little bit about the history of mental health. The history of mental health. And I'm not going to go too deep in this. I'm just going to touch on a few years and a few concepts and understandings so that uh, we just have some context for the history of mental health. The early days of psychotherapy, you know, many 18th century treatments for psychological distress are based on pseudoscientific ideas such as phrenology. And phrenology is the study of the shape of the skulls developed by representing um, a, rep a respected, sorry, uh, anatomist, Franz Joseph Gall. And you may be familiar with this due to the racist history of this idea of looking at skulls to determine intelligence. And this is something that they utilize with black folks, especially on plantations. And they would talk about the mongrel skulls and the Neanderthal skulls and the African skulls. <laughs> and, and, you know, they would talk about all these skulls and what these things meant as far as personality, as far as intelligence, right? These very racist Eurocentric ideas of who and how people should, who, are, who and how people are, who and how, and how they contributed to the world and what they do. And we know this is a bunch of crap. But this is what they would do. You know, Django Unchained in that movie had a great um, scene that kind of talked about this Leonardo DiCaprio's character, kind of broke this down. That was one of the bigger scenes in the movie, one of this long monologue to actually talk about this kind of phrenology understanding of psychotherapy of mental health, of intelligence. So mental health has never been a friend to Africans, to black folks, never. Not to more recently when you get folks like Naeem Akbar, Bobby E. Wright, Dr. Francis Chris Wells, and Dr. Amos Wilson, uh, Dr. Joy DeGruy Leary, or D Dr. Joy DeGruy, right? Dr. Patricia Newton, Hell, even Dr. Umar Johnson. Until more recently, psychology, mental health has started to become, has been looked at from an Afrocentric place. Dr. Wade Nobles, Dr. Leonard Jeffries. <laughs> no, I can I can keep going. <laughs> There's so many, so many smart, intelligent masters of psychology that we have that are understudied and under uh, uh, praised. But most of psychology gets praised through old white men with very racist ideals on the world. Ideals of conquest, ideals of subjugation, ideals of colonization, right? So the early days of psychotherapy were good to really no one but white men, affluent white men at that. You know, we used to have negative things happen to us. You know, they would crack open slave skulls to look at them while they're still alive, technically killing these folks to study their brains. And there's a lot of things that end up happening to us as black folks. Some of you may have heard of dreptomania. Dreptomania was a conjectural mental illness that in 1851, American physician Samuel A. Cartwright hypothesized as the cause of enslaved African spleen captivity. It has since been debunked as pseudoscience and part of the edifice of scientific racism. So the thought process that an African did not want to be a slave was utilized as a quote unquote mental health disorder at this time. We didn't have the DSM at that time, but it was a it was a condition that they said, these Africans don't want to be slaves. Huh, something must be wrong with them. Let's call it tryptomania. They must be out of their God-loving minds. They don't want to be raped. They don't want to be for forced to work from dawn to dusk. What is wrong with these blacks, these Africans, right? We weren't even Negroes yet at that time. We weren't even Negroes. Speaking of Negroes, one thing that I often, I often get a lot of pushback on is I kind of make a joke of this, but it's really serious. But black folks, we are a GMO people. We are genetically modified people. <laughs> 
okay? Like, Negroes are the genetic product of the sickness of racism and white supremacy, this American-style version of it, right? And this is why I like when people are like, um, uh, uh, Yvette Carnell say things like, we need lineage therapy, because we do. We need lineage therapy. And what, the, and what that concept is, is understanding the historical pain that we've been through, this intergenerational trauma that we've been through, and how do we heal from that? Because of things like this, dreptomania, that you are supposed to want to be captivated, enslaved, mutilated, raped, treated like trash. And that's the state of mind that you should accept. And if you don't, then something's wrong with you. And we have these smaller versions of this dreptomania now, where when Black folks are frustrated about the conditions that we're in, and we speak up about them, or we attempt to do things about them, and people look at us like you're crazy, like, you don't want to be American? just like what we have with ADOS. But what about, well, wait, you can't be an uh, American descendant of slave. What about the other black people? Well, damn it, there's something that happened to folks <laughs> who have slavery in their lineage. So again, drapedomania was one of the ways that they looked at us. Take a look at a few dates, right? It's gonna be a couple slides of dates. So in 19, or sorry, in 1892, the foundation of the American was the foundation of the American Psychological Association, also known as the APA. APA is still around. The APA is very, very, very instrumental in a lot of things that happen in the medical world and in the psychological world. Uh, the AP, if, if the APA doesn't have a stamp on it, chances are it will not be something that's known. It was headed by G. Stanley Hall at the time. In 1896, the first psychological clinic was developed at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, marking the birth of clinical psychology. This is important. This was at the turn of the century. This is the first psychological clinic, clinical psychology therapy, mental health. This is the first clinic that was developed at the University mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania during this time. And you have to remember that in this time you have a lot of Quakers, right? You have a lot of these people who are trying to do well, the white folks, right? through a religious lens. We also have in 1896, this is also when the Mohawk Conference happened. If you're not familiar with the Mohawk Conference, that's something that you definitely want to check out. Uh, there's some documents online that you can hopefully they haven't took, you know, clean the, scrub the internet off <laughs> just yet. But if you need to get those, highlight me later, the emails at the end of the presentation, I, I should be able to forge you some of those Mohawk Conference documents. But at this Mohawk Conference, you had very affluent uh, masters of the universe, these white folks, mostly men, who got together to answer, what do we do with these Negroes? At the turn of the century, our economy's changing over. They're no longer slaves. They've been out of slavery for 30 years. What do we do with these Negroes? They had a conference on that to figure out what they're going to do with us Negroes. Right? And they've been trying to answer this Negro question, the Negro problem question, for over 100 plus years. Right? So moving forward, 1900, Sigmund Freud published The Interpretation of Dreams, marking the beginning of psychoanalytic thought. Now, this is important because you, most people have heard of Freud and Freudian slips and Freudian thought and even his perversion sexually. But Freud was really one of the first people to, uh, he wasn't the first person to publish um, a psychological textbook, but he was one of the bigger names to do it. Like, he would be like the, low, well, he wouldn't be the first. He would be like the Michael Jordan of the psychology world. People put him at the pinnacle. He's the top, right? Um, and even though he had his own sicknesses and things too, that was him. And even to this day, psychoanalytic thought is still taught. Most of your psychologists, people who have PsyDs, they've learned from a psychoanalytic lens. And psychoanalytics has been a huge um, influencer for most mental health disciplines. And for folks who don't know, Mental health has multiple disciplines, multiple theories, um, and multiple ways of getting licensed or tracks to get licensed. It's not just one thing. You don't just go get a degree in mental health. Um, you usually have a particular type that you get it done. It's kind of like, kind of like people who go get their you know, degrees in like divinity, right? So you have different types of religions that you might follow or focus based on your interests, and you get a degree kind of tailored towards that. Anything with mental health, but regardless of what the actual discipline is mental health wise psychoanalytics is definitely a part of that even black psychology there's a lot of psychoanalytic uh 
uh, concepts that have that have really been taken from African concepts. That's what Freud did, and flipped from a European standpoint. So really, we were just retaking our own stuff back <laughs> and not having that perversion in it, um, like like Freud did have. But that's a whole another lecture. But just just know that a lot of this comes out of the comedic wisdom of the continent of Africa, but it was split with the European perversion on it. In 1911, Alfred Adler left Freudian psychoanalytic group to form his own school of thought, accusing Freud of overemphasizing uh, sexuality and basing his theories on his own childhood. Very important. Alfred Adler is somebody that you should definitely study. Uh, I am biased towards this. My second master's degree is from the Adlerian Graduate School. So I come from this kind of thought process. I think it fits very well with uh, black folks. I think that it's one of the it's one of the concepts that makes a whole hell of a lot of sense to me as far as how do you help people get better. But Aller seen the sickness, the, the sickness of Freud and got up out of there. He didn't last very long. And really it was three people that were really instrumental in what we now know as a psychological world today, especially this Western American version of psychology. It was Alfred Adler, it was Carl Jung, and it was Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was, <laughs> Freudian slip there. Sigmund Freud was like the head person. He was the big dog. And then he kind of had his, his Scottie Pippen. He was like LeBron James. Alfred Adler was like Dwayne Wade. And Carl Jung was like uh, uh, Chris Bosh, if you want to look at the old Miami Heat team. So it was like a three-headed monster, right? Um, but eventually, Freud or Adler left Freud, and then Jung uh, left Freud as well. So in 1913, two years later, Carl Jung ended up departing from Freud uh, for Freudian's views and developed his own theories, citing Freud's inability to acknowledge religion and spirituality. So again, his perversions did not allow him to touch into the spiritual realm, which we also know is a struggle for a lot of European folks, and you can highlight Dr. Uh, Marumba Ani's work with Yurugu. She talks about that, right? So Yurugu gets into that. So that, that, that inability to tap into that spirituality piece is huge, and in most psychology, they don't touch it even to today. Um, you know, they actually kind of shy away from it unless you're going to get a counseling degree in some kind of religious faction like, like uh, uh, divinity. Typically, they shy away from the religion talk because Freud didn't do it, so and it never got passed down. Social learning theory, you know, generations after generations after generation without applying it doesn't happen, which is one of the big things that we struggle with as Black folks when it comes to therapy is that there's not the, the spiritual piece is kind of taken out of it, unfortunately, even though we're very spiritual people, whether you want to look at it from a Christian, Muslim view, or even from a just a divine spirit to whoever creator you have, um, that piece is often taken out of psychotherapy, which I think is one of the things that hinders us from actually going. So uh, back to Jung, uh, his new school of thought became known as the analytic psychology. A couple more dates, 1942, Carl Rogers published Counseling and the Psychotherapy, suggesting that respect and a non-judgmental approach to therapy is the foundation for effective treatment of mental illness. People who have been classified as mentally ill have never been treated right in the world. Um, they were always treated, they, back in Europe, they used to lock them up, chain them up, beat them, right? They used to just do all types of horrific things to them. And not until 1942 was when someone said, hey, maybe we should start treating people a little different, even though they have a mental health disorder. Maybe we should try to help these folks and give them some damn respect and dignity and not be so judgmental. <laughs> it literally took that long, 1942. In 1945, the Journal of Clinical Psychology was founded. This is important because now we're starting to produce research on, on psychology and understanding what's going on people and learning about these new disorders. 1952, this is important, the Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Disorders, the DSM, was published by the American Psychiatrics Association, marking the beginning of the modern mental illness classification. This is where you get your diagnosis. So schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, all these things started to get marked for the first time during, uh, for the first time was 1952. All right, and now we're at the DSM-5. We've, we've gone through 
uh, really six revisions, but we're at the fifth version of the DSM. Also during this time that's important to understand is that homosexuality was actually a mental health disorder and it was in that original book uh, that was published in 1952. Um, it's no longer considered a mental health disorder, uh, but it was a, it, that, that was one of the big controversial things when it was taken out. Um, uh, and, and people don't realize that or know that people who were considered LGBTQ were considered to have a mental illness back in the 1950s, which is, it's an interesting concept, right? It's an interesting concept. In 1968, the DSM-2 was published by the American Psychiatric Association. So this is the second version. So they had, you know, 16 years of trial and error trying to figure this thing out, and they popped out the second version. Another very important thing, 1968 was a huge year for several things. One of the big ones that's more important to black folks is that the Association of Black Psychologists, ABSI, which I am a member of, was, the found, was founded at the APA meeting in San Francisco. San Francisco is very important when it comes to black psychology because we have a lot of our scholars coming out of there, Dr. Wade Nobles being one of them. A lot of our black scholars came out of that. And a lot of black scholars are still there, San Francisco State University, all through the Cal University system. We have a lot of very instrumental black scholars. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them are getting up there in age and we need to replenish them and we need to utilize our elders and some of even our ancestors and have a lot of young folks like myself start to step into their place. Um, and we don't have a lot of us, but we need more. We need more of us. In 1980, the DSM-3 was published. So again, they did another reversion, right? And then in 1994, so 14 years later, they had DSM-4 was published by the Association of Psychologists. DSM-4 was then, uh, it was then worked on again uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. They had the DSM-4, I think it was TI or IT, I can't remember. There was another updated version. And then ultimately in 2015 was released the DSM-5, which is this big blue book here. This is what we call the mental health Bible. Any psychological disorders that you want to know about will be found in this book. All right. All the current ones. So if you want to know what the symptoms of schizophrenia are, what bipolar disorder is, the difference between bipolar one, bipolar two, if you want to know any other mood disorders, depression, any anxiety disorders, PTSD, all that stuff is in this book. It's a very important book because if anyone gets diagnosed with anything, the person who diagnosed them utilized this textbook to qualify what their diagnosis is. So if you ever are diagnosed yourself or you have a child or someone that's been diagnosed, you know, this book is going to tell you what the symptoms are um, to help you understand what that diagnosis is. It's called the DSM-5 for short, which is, again, the Diagnostic to Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, and this is the fifth edition. And they probably won't update this again until close to 2030. Psychology has a dark side. It's not all peaches and cream and helping people. Um, and of course it isn't when Europeans are <laughs> involved with it, right? Because they use science to conquer. And one of, the, one of the people I'll talk about, the person who brought this to light, but one of the theories of this is something we call psychohistory. Psychohistory is the science of historical motivations, combinations, um, uh, combines the insights of psychotherapy with research and methodology of the social science to understand the emotional organs of the social and political behavior of groups and nations past and present. This is a very fascinating study. If you're interested in understanding dynamics and why people do the things that they do, you definitely want to check out psychohistory because it looks at the dark side of psychology and why people behave the way they do and talks a lot about the sexual abuse that happens talks a lot about the shame, the guilt that happens with people, and what motivates people's behaviors to act the way that they act. This study was brought forth by this man here, Lloyd Dumas. And Dumas was the founder of the Association for Psychohistory, the Journey for Psychohistory, and the co-founder of the international, of the international founder of the Association for Psychohistory, right? Uh, the Journal of Psychohistory and co-founder, I kind of double, I, I double did that one, sorry about that, but 
Dumas, very important individual, he brought this forward. He's been criticized heavily by, by his own folks for talking about the reasons why people do the things that they do, because he's, un, he's unearthing a lot of truths to European culture and European psyche. So definitely wanted to bring him forward so that you knew this name, you could do more research on Lord Dumas and this concept known as psychohistory. But what about the mental health of the enslaved African? What about the mental health of the enslaved African? You know, black folks have struggled emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually for a long time. When you look at, I'll come back to this one in a second. When you think about us, think about what was the life like to live on a plantation? How much fear and anxiety had to be present? on that plantation, where at any moment you could be forced to do anything, sexually, physically, against your will, that you had to perform, you had to work, you had to still be a parent. Hell, you had to raise other people's kids. You couldn't be a man on a plantation you couldn't be a woman on a plantation. Hell, you couldn't even be a child on a plantation. What you could be is a slave. And that has to leave a very traumatic imprint on the psyche of black people. But when I hear things like you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, or slavery happened so long ago, get over it. This is 2019, this is 2020, we have iPhones, right? You got a job, you make money, what, what are you complaining about? The pain that our ancestors have experienced is still there. Enslavement happened for over four, or sorry, yeah, pretty much. For hundreds of years. Hundreds of years enslavement was going on. Do you know how many generations we've had of black people who were enslaved? Those stress hormones, that's cortisol levels. That spiritual pain that we've been through transitions from one generation to the next. And believe it or not, slaves are still able to have moments of joy. Moments of compassion, moments of pleasure, even under those conditions. Our black genius was still able to shine. Our ability to be resilient was still able to manifest itself. Even through that pain that we went through. And that's important for us to understand. And that's what gives me hope about where we are today. Because we don't live a life like our ancestors lived. And hell, things are still terrible, but they're not what they used to be, which gives me hope that we can definitely move forward, continue to evolve and grow, and continue to let our black genius shine and our resiliency manifest. I believe that. But I want you to think about what, what would the mental health of the enslaved African be like where you were given a name, not by your parents, but by someone else, right? When you were told that you could not practice your religion or were you seen, you know, people from your tribe, maybe even your family members get raped, molested, thrown off the boat from the Mayafa, from the travel of the 20, you know, the travel across the Atlantic just to get here, to get sold off and to grow somewhat old and see, you know, maybe your children get sold off, get abused, right? What, think about the mental health that you had to go through as a enslaved African. So people ask me questions like, why black folks don't go to therapy? That's a damn interesting question. 
And this is typically how I look like this young lady here. It's like, sheesh. That's a, <laughs> it's a good one. That's a really good question why we don't. It's a really good question why we don't, right? I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we don't and some of those things here in a moment. But one thing that we have done is we've adapted to the situation that we live in. We have gotten to this point where we have just kind of accepted it. It is what it is. We even say that. <laughs> it is what it is. Like, you know, it's our life. What can you do about it? But it can we can do things about it. We can get better. So although anyone can develop a mental health problem. African-Americans sometimes express more severe forms of mental health conditions due to unmet needs and other barriers. Barriers being racism, white supremacy, anti-blackness, right? Dysfunction, lack of information, lack of access, right? According to the Health and Human Service Office of Minority Health, African Americans are 20 percent more likely to experience serious mental health problems than the general population. Think that not. Hello. According to the Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health, African Americans are 20 percent more likely to experience serious mental health problems than the general population. Damn. Common mental health disorders amongst African Americans include depression, anxiety, stress slash trauma related disorders. Okay, we're 20% more likely to experience serious mental health issues. And we are also more likely not to do a damn thing about it that's healthy. We typically do unhealthy coping behaviors. You know, smoking, drinking, um, you know, a lot of promiscuous sex, a lot of violence, soft and hard violence, soft violence being arguing, gossiping, playing the dozens, joning, flaming, frying, all this, talking about people. Hard violence being, you know, physical, guns, knives, fists, kicks, right? We're very quick to let off this rage and this frustration and, these, and this anger due to our mental condition being unhealthy and being in unhealthy positions, right? So this is where we're at. We've adapted to this. This adaption has become our culture of struggle, right? This fight continues, the struggle continues. We even call our culture the struggle. We've called our culture the struggle for the longest time because we have associated black life with always being a struggle. And I'm here to say it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a struggle. It's definitely gonna be a challenge but it doesn't have to be a struggle. When I say a challenge, nothing's given. Like I said earlier, nothing's given, nothing's guaranteed, but it doesn't have to always be a struggle. It can be a challenge. Hell, sometimes it might be a fight, but we, don't, we shouldn't have to identify black life as a struggle. We have too many tools at our dispense. We have too much collective genius, and we have too much damn melanin and excellence to allow ourselves to continue to struggle. And I know that if we get organized, if we start our healing journey, that we are gonna be a force across the world that people don't know what to do. We already influence culture like no other. Imagine what happens when we start to influence these other things. I chose this photo here, you know. <laughs> it's funny because I know people in this photo. Kill white supremacy and Black Lives Matter. We've been on this fight for identity, civil rights, you know, but now even reparations for too long. We need to man we need to evolve beyond the struggle. 